The last question on the worksheet on Thursday about the student who was guessing on multiple choice questions on their exam was supposed to demonstrate this pattern that we saw occurring. So actually, let me, let me bring up that worksheet really quick and show you what that pattern was. What we saw in the worksheet was this pattern. We were essentially doing what we considered in part five to be a sampling with replacement question. Uh, it's sampling with replacement because in this case, each of our trials were independent. Each one of these questions the student was working on on the test did not influence the next one. So the probability of getting the question right or wrong was always stayed consistent, right? The probabilities that you got the student, the question correct was always equal to 0.2. One out of five chance because we have multiple choice, whereas the probability that she got the question incorrect was an eighty percent chance, a four out of five shot. So these probabilities stayed consistent and gave us this pattern that we sort of saw that we decreased the number of incorrects each time as we made this table, increasing the number of correct answers. Um, and the only thing that was sort of funky and that we didn't like so much was trying to figure out the number out in front. How many ways could we possibly order this? And in class, I made a giant, terrible tree diagram with all 16 possible ways that quiz could go. And we could actually circle and see, oh, these are the six times she got two right. Uh, but there's got to be an easier way. And this pattern is actually what we are learning about in 5.2. So in 5.2, oh, I didn't need to do that. 5.2, we're talking about the binomial distribution, which is exactly what we saw there in that worksheet. So in order for something to be a binomial, four things have to be true. Follow a binomial distribution. There must be a fixed number of trials. So in our example in that worksheet, there were four questions. Each of these questions is considered a trial or an observation. This is our random event. These are our kittens that we're pulling, right? Um, so each time we pull something that's a trial, there's some random outcome that's gonna happen. We actually call these uh, technically Bernoulli trials. Um, they're called Bernoulli trials. Actually, I'll just skip for the third bullet point. Uh, Bernoulli trials have two outcomes, either a success or a failure. Um, so either this or not this. They are mutually exclusive and they are complements of each other. So those are our two pieces. So every trial, there's two things that can happen, success or failure. Our goal in these particular binomial experiments is to count up the number of successes. So in our previous example, this was the number of questions she got correct on the test. So whenever we're counting, that's when we're dealing with this binomial distribution. A Bernoulli trial is just a single trial. Is it right or wrong? Or is it success or failure? Binomials, how many successes do we have? If you've taken a stats class before or know anything about probability, you may have seen what we call a hypergeometric distribution, which is where we say, well, what's the number of, number of trials before we reach our first success? So there's a lot of different ways that we look at these sort of Bernoulli trials um, that they're related to these other distributions. But binomial is counting up our number of successes. Other pieces we need in order for this to be true, um, these trials or observations must be independent of one another. One must not influence the next. Uh, this means that all of our sampling with replacements are immediately out because our first trial, when we take out that black kitten or that red marble, whatever it may be, it is going to change the probability on the next case, which means they are dependent on one another. Um, so to me, this independent idea goes hand in hand with this last piece, which is our probability of success has to be the same for every trial. Otherwise, we can't leverage that pattern we saw in the example um, in the previous question. Um, if that was like a test of mine. Sometimes I have four multiple choice. Sometimes I have five multiple choice answers. So you could not use the binomial distribution to talk about a student guessing on one of my tests because that probability of success is 25% on a one out of four multiple choice, but it's 20% on the one out of five. So um, in our particular example before, our probability, or which we just denote as P for probability of success here is 20%. And our probability of failure well, that's always just one minus p. 
So we've got those two pieces. And once you've got all of that, we've got all the notation, everything we need for the binomial. Uh, and again, we've actually seen this part before. X was the number of successes, right? The only thing new here is this squiggly line notation here at the bottom. This is just shorthand. This is shorthand for us statisticians. It tells me that X follows. This says X follows a binomial. That's what the B stands for with n trials and p probability of success. So that's that's what that tells us. That's like writing a whole sentence is this squiggly line notation. And we're going to see more of this notation as we move through the course and we learn about more distributions. So this is just our first introduction to it. It's just shorthand. That's all it tells us. So those probabilities in that last example can be found using this formula. So our formula is probability that our number of success is equal to k is n choose k, p to the k, our probability of success to the k, and q to the n minus k. So I'm going to go ahead and just do this once for our example that we did before. If you remember our probability of x was equal to 2, this is the one that most students got wrong when we were doing this by hand in class because they couldn't figure out this, the number of ways to order. So this combinations formula is what this is. Um, this n choose k is what we usually say this as, those of us in the know. This was the piece that we had to do painstakingly by hand, which sucked, and now we don't need to do that. So if we were to do this question, we had four trials, right? Four different questions. We wanted two of them to be successes. Probability of success was 0.2, probability of failure was 0.8, and that needs to be to the 4 minus 2. So now we're very close to what we had on the worksheet, 0.2 squared, 0.8 squared. The only thing is, is that we need that 6, that 4 choose 2. Now there are a number of ways to do this. One is this formula here, which actually shows you the number of possible ways to do the ordering uh, using factorials. Uh, a factorial just so we know, if you have 7 factorial, 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, everything multiplied together, that's what a factorial means. So if you were to do this for this example, you'd have 4 factorial all over 2 factorial, 4 minus 2 factorial, which is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, all over 2 times 1, and 4 minus 2 is just 2 again, so another 2 times 1. So those would cancel, leaving you with just your 6. So that's how the formula works. Now, we should not have to use this formula. I will not give you that formula on the test. Um, as you'll see on Tuesday when I get you guys your formula sheets, this formula will be given to you on the test, um, but this one will not. And that's because we can do this in our calculator. So I'm going to show you that here. We're going to go ahead and do one example, and I'll end this video and make another one for the actual application of the formula. But if we want to do 10 choose 6 in our calculator, here's how we would do that. And this should say successes. Make it notes for myself. Oh, uh, where is my calculator? There it is. So the, that combinations button is in the math section. So if you go into the math section, it's over in the probability submenu. By the way, this is how you turn things into fractions which is a, a sweet button to know for a real math class. Um, if ever you get a decimal out and you're supposed to give a fraction answer, you just use that. But we're going to go over to the probability menu. And you can see we have a random number generator. Uh, we have what is called the permutations um, version. And then we need the combinations, this NCR. So we're going to go ahead and press Enter. Now one thing you'll notice is that the first thing it says is answer. And that's because this is like pressing subtraction. It says, well, what am I subtracting from? So really, I needed to type in that 10 first and then go get the NCR button. So type in 10, then go to math, go over to probability, and choose NCR 6. So how many ways can I order my six successes in 10 slots? Well, according to this, there are 210 ways. So if I went back to my thing. This is 210. And this is all about the same thing we were doing in class. If I had 10 questions on that quiz and I wanted to see how many ways can I reorder so that those six correct answers, 
this would not be something you want to do by hand because there's 210 different ways for this to happen. So uh, I'll end the video here and we'll do the next exercise in a separate video.